Today I would like to explain a little bit more about the use of C-Engineer to model and calculate civil engineering structures. My name is Jeff Baines and I'm a customer service consultant at the headquarters of SIA in Belgium. Now this webinar is about type of structures that are used in the hydraulic part of civil engineering like water reservoirs, overflow basin, pools, tanks, etc. And in this webinar we will show you this model that we are seeing here. So we will talk about the modeling and the modeling of the soil and water loads and also how the subsoil can be calculated. So this can be done with the Winkler or the Pasternak model. Then the calculation will be done, the soil will also be calculated and we will go to the results and continue with the reinforcement design and to a punching check. And these results will also be shown in the engineering report which we will very briefly show because we also have other webinars to explain the engineering report. So we will first start by modeling our structure in C-Engineer. So this will be done in a new project, we will start from zero, from scratch. And when we start a new project, we will indicate which type of projects and which materials we want to use. And the material that I choose here will be the default. You can always pick other materials, but by default it will propose this material. And reinforcement calculations will also be done by default with the indicated material. In a functionality window, I will also activate the subsoil. Then when I start the project, you can see that the main menu is initialized and I can make a model by using line grids or the PIM toolbox, um, but that's not what I'm going to do today. I'm going to start in the structure menu itself. Here I'm going to load in a plan. I received some plans about the model that I have to make and I'm going to base my model on these plans. To do that, I will load in these plans. So I have a DXF file and this DXF file is here. These lines can be loaded in C-Engineer. So the lines, they don't have any real analysis value, but they can easily be used to do the design. So I will place this block in the center, in the coordinate 0, 0. And I will continue my modelization by using these lines. So first of all, I'm going to use a plate. So my ground plate, my base plate, is modeled as plate. The plate will have a thickness of 500 and I'm going to model it using the top side and I'm going to place my thickness on the lower end. So the system plane will be at the top. Now I can use these lines here, you see the red dots, they indicate to which points I can snap onto. And I'm going to use the second line from outside and just going to follow it by indicating its corners. And by just clicking on these points, I've indicated the surface of the plate. I can also activate the volume and then you can see that this entire volume is the plate. Now to add the walls, I will pick wall. And the wall will be placed in the center by using the center. And it will have a height of 1.6 meter. To place the wall, I'm going to follow this line. Now the thickness of 500 meter is of course not coincidental. It is chosen because that is a real thickness and it could also be derived from the plants. Now the wall, the walls actually, there are four walls so I'm indicating I'm placing them individually, separately, at the outer edge. So now I've already created the basin with the walls and all I have to do is place the columns. And as you can see here there is also an opening. Okay, let me focus on the opening first. So this opening, let's see, it goes from this point up until here. So it has a diameter of 0.2. 8 meters or 9. I will take half of it, 0 0.888. So I'm now going to place opening in the wall. So in the 2D member components I have an opening. Now it says select any slab as master. So the master is this the plate on which I'm going to put the opening. It's going to be this wall. And the opening can be defined by using straight lines, arcs, but also by just defining a circle with its center and one point on the edge. So that's what I'm going to use. And then I can use this 
upward line here, select its outer point, its outer end, and the point that I will select will be projected onto the wall. Now for my diameter, what I have to give is the array, so I will use relative coordinates, 0.444. If I use 0.444, then the diameter will be 0.888. And just with that, I have defined an opening in my basin. To place the columns, uh, first I will have to derive the dimensions. So on these positions, they have columns. Now, first I will take the measurement tool and I will measure this distance. So it's 500 by 500. Okay. So I will now choose for a column, then the column needs cross-section, I'll pick the rectangle, and I know now that the rectangle has to be 500 with 500. OK, and I'm going to place it at the bottom, and it will also be 1.6 meters high. Now, to place this, I'm just going to pick the midpoint, so my snap settings allow me to click on the midpoint, and then again the midpoint and the midpoint. Now that I've placed three, that's enough. I'm going to use the copy option, so modify copy. I have to define my starting point, which is here in this node, and then my end point. And then the three columns, they are copied along to the vector that I'm defining now. And this will be my model, which I will use. If I activate the volumes, you will see here that it corresponds correctly, uh, perfectly, according to the plan. Next step will be to place a sport. That will be the next step. So, if I go a little bit further in the list, so by default you also work top to down, you will see model data, and under model data I have supports. Now I will use a surface support, and a surface support is well, a support under a surface, quite obviously. For these parameters, I have to determine what the soil parameters are, and I can use the library to determine these. So there is a system database, I can read data from the system database. I will copy all this data to my project, and here you can see if I have a certain material, then you can see what the corresponding soil parameters are. So if you would pick a certain sand, then you see that the vertical stiffness is 50. Now the horizontal, for numerical reasons, you will have to fill in a value greater than 1, and I'm going to pick 1.5, which is 10% of the C1Z. And this subsoil will be placed on the lower plate, and the subsoil is also indicated with the triangles, as you can see here. Now, in the structure menu, there is also one last command that I always have to perform when I'm modeling, which is the connect member nodes option. So this option will check if certain elements should be connected in reality. For example, I have here the ground plate. What the program does not know is whether the wall is connected to the plate. And that's what this command does. It will check those things. So if I'm going to continue, it will check everything within certain distances, you see that these tolerances they are quite small, and everything within these tolerances will be connected. You see it has made 19 intersections, so 19 things have been connected, and these 19 things, those are actually my 4 walls and my 15 columns. And you can see it also, uh, for example, in this node, you can see that the node now has been coupled to both the 2D member and the 1D member. Or here you have an intersection line, and this intersection line, it connects two 2D members, two surface elements. And then finally you can also do a check of your structure data, which will check whether or not your, your project is correctly modeled. So for example, if you have two beams over each other, or you have a beam of zero length, or doesn't matter, this will check this data. So this is my model, and the next step I'm going to put loads on it. Now the loads, they are always defined in load cases. So here under load cases and combinations, I can define these load cases. First uh, load case, we use the cell fate. And the advantage of using cell fate in SIA is that it can calculate this automatically. So if the load type is cell fate, it will automatically calculate the weight of the structure and put it in this load case.
and the weight of the construction is determined by the surface of the plates and its thickness and the area of the cross section of the columns and the, their length. So all this data is already known and the self weight can automatically be derived from this. I also create a new load case for my water loads. Now the water inside the structure is not always the same, so let's assume this is a variable load. Now I have another load case for the ground pressure. Let's assume this is a permanent load. And then the fourth one for loads coming from the top. So for example, if there would be another plate or something on this entire basin, it would pose a vertical load. So load upper structure. And then inside these load cases I can place loads. So that's done with the load menu. So here I can see my four load cases with three points. I can go back to those load cases and add, delete them. And in each load case I can also add loads. Except for load case one, because this one is calculated automatically, so you cannot place any additional loads in it. Now for load case two, the water load, we will have to use three loads. So to place our soil and water loads, we will use the free surface loads. And these are very powerful and flexible tools to generate loads onto the elements. And as you can see in the images below, the load, to indicate it in green, is the free load. The free load is independent from the structure. It can be placed against the structure, but that doesn't mean it is linked to it. And what the free load will do, it will project itself onto elements under its projection surface. And its projection surface can be upwards, but also downwards. And it will generate these orange loads, and the orange loads are the generated loads. And these loads, they are really on the elements. They will be the ones that are calculated. And with one free load, you can also generate multiple generated loads. So as you can see in the image here, one free load has generated three generated loads. So we can also play a little bit with the selection on which elements it can project itself. Or as you can see here for this, this pool, one free load has placed loads on all the edges and also the lower surface. Now let's apply this in CI Engineer. So in CI Engineer we will use the free loads to model the water loads on the structure. Now a free load is free. The free means it's free in space. It's free from being attached to elements. The load itself is completely free. And due to this there is a limitation about where you can place the load. A free load must always be placed in this XY plane that you see here. So this plane that is uh, simulated with these dots and of course the extension of it. Now the advantage is that I can manipulate this plane. I can move it. I can replace it. And that can be done with this button or you can go through tools and then you also see UCS, User Coordinate System. Now we'll place it according to a local coordinate system, so um, according to a certain element. And the element that I will choose is a wall, for example this wall. And you see that my, my plane with the points, the dot grid, has now been moved and is now vertical. As you can see, here it is. Now the i-axis is downwards. I don't like it, so I will rotate it. So again, I go to the same option menu, but now I will choose Rotate, and I will rotate it 180 degrees. So the y-axis is now upwards. Then I will pick Surface Load, and I will pick the Free Surface Load. These properties, I will configure them after I have placed the Surface Load. So first of all, I have to stay inside of this plane, but this plane has been aligned with the wall. So I can choose the wall as reference and I can click on the outer points of the wall to place my surface load. Now you can see here this is the green surface load, so this is the original surface load and I will now configure it. Now, how does this work? This will generate loads, as I've told you, and the generated load will have its load in a certain direction. It's quite obvious that a load must have a direction. But then, on the other hand, 
this Z direction, what does it mean? Well, in itself it doesn't mean anything because a direction only has meaning when there is a system which defines the direction. So you have to look at these two together. And what direction of load has water? Well, water is always perpendicular to the element. And if it is always perpendicular to the element, it means that I have to look at the um, not the global coordinate system, but local coordinate system. Because each element in C Engineer has a local coordinate system. Now I can show these if I uh, go to the view parameters and under structure. I can show these local axes. So I'll show them for the 2D elements. And the local axes of the elements, they are defined in the center of the element. These are the local axes. The local axes of the element, they define what the upper and the lower side is of the element, what the x direction is and the y direction. And the z is always perpendicular to the element. And the water load was also always perpendicular to the element, which means that my generated load should be in the z direction according to the system of the element. And this can be done by choosing here member LCS. This says that the generated load will be according to the local coordinate system of the member and in which direction, the z direction of this system. And the distribution will not be uniform because it's water. It will be uh, variable in the y direction. So this is the y direction of my um, free load. If I set it to zero, then I can see uh, that this corresponds to the lower side. So I want this to be 16 because I have a wall of 1.6 meter height. And the other other end has to be zero. Now it only has to place its load on certain elements which I will select. So for this reason I will change this property to select. Now I can select manually on which elements free load can be projected. I still have to configure this projection, so I can do that by choosing update 2D member selection. If I click on update 2D member selection, here it says select 2D members. I will select all of them, click on escape. So now I've configured this option and if I will generate this load then you can now see how the load is placed on the different elements. So first of all what I see is that's not going according to my wishes. So this water load is now on the outside but it should be on the inside. It's pushing my, my ground level upwards, while well it should be pushing it downwards. So that's all not, not, not good, not correct. So I'm going to delete this. And if I delete a generated load, then the original load will appear again. I will select the free surface again, and I will choose minus 16. Which means that all generated loads will now be placed on the other side of the element. If I click on generate, then on this side it's much better. It's going from inside to outside. And on my lower plate it's also pushing down, which is also very good. But on my other end the property is not, the direction is not okay. Why is this? Because my local z-axis is pointing outwards. And here it was pointing inwards, which means that the plates do not know what the inside and what the outside is. So if I select this wall, then I can choose swap orientation. And now this wall knows what the inside is. So the local z-axis is pointing inwards. From this wall it's also pointing inwards. For the bottom plate it's also pointing inwards. Here it's also pointing inwards, and for my last wall, well, it's not okay, I also have to swap it. Now it's also pointing inwards. Now to see the effect of these changes, let's generate the loads once again. And now the loads should all be generated properly. So we can see here, these are going outwards. If I rotate structure, these are going outwards. If I check, these are also going outwards, so now this is all going correctly. Now with one single free load, I have defined loads on the entire structure. And this way you can see that it's really a powerful tool. Now let's do the same thing 
for our ground loads. But I will use an additional trick now. So let's say that in fact the ground doesn't stop at just the top of this wall, but the ground is even going higher. So the ground pressure would also be higher even at this point. Now you can do this in different ways. Um, I will pick a free surface load. Again, I don't worry about the properties, I will first place it. I will go a little bit too far, but on the, the correct height, to the other end, also a little bit too far. And I will go upwards for several meters. Now I can check here in the corner what the position is of my mouse button. So now it says 73, 0. I'm going upwards to 73, 3. Here I'm doing somewhat the same thing. So now I see that these lines are rectangular, which is okay. So I've actually placed a free load which is too high. Now let me set it again. It will be Z according to uh, member LCS. Let's see, it will not be uniform, but it will vary in the Y direction. This point corresponds to the lower side which is 60, because my ground will have a weight of 20 uh, per meter depth. And zero. And my ground pressure is coming from the outside to the inside. Now let's see what happens when I generate the loads. When I generate the loads, you will see that the value here is not zero. And the value that it's taken is just the value that the free load has at that height. So at somewhat uh, this height, I guess, or a little bit here. And I can also show you this value um, if I generate this load. And then I go to the view properties. I can go to loads and masses and activate the labels of loads. And you'll see it's 28 over there and 60 over there. Or if this is not clear for you, I can always go to setup, fonts, and then for my loads I can change the size. But as you can see, the generated loads are also not on all planes. Why is this happening? Well, that's because I left the selection to automatic. So I'll put it to select and then I will update the 2D member selection myself. Now in this case, because it's ground pressure, I do not want it working here on the lower plate, because on the lower plate my subsoil will give me the ground pressure. So let's generate these loads again, and now you will see that the loads are correct. They work from the outside to the inside and not on the ground plate. And for our final part, our load on the upper structure, I will place point loads, so uh, point force in node, on the columns. So the weight of the upper structure is now placed on top of the columns and the walls. So here I will choose minus 300, for example. I will rotate my structure so that I can easily place them. And then on these walls I'm also going to put some load, for example, a line force on 2D member edge, and it will be, let's say, minus 30, in the Z direction according to the global axis. So again, if I want to do this very smartly, I can rotate the structure and select all the upper edges at once. Now this value is very small compared to this line, why is it? Because this value is 300 and this one 30. So the 30 is 10 times smaller than the 300. So also the drawing follows the values. Now that we have our loads, we can prepare combinations and then we can go forward to the calculation. So if I go to my combination menu, then you will see here the different load cases and I can create any type of combination that I want actually. So let's create an old limit state combination and give a proper name to it. And I'm going to do the same thing, but then for a service limit state combination, and for example, quasi-permanent, 
I will here give it the name SLS. So now I have two combinations for the results, and these combinations I will also put them in a class. Um, you will see later why. This is for the reinforcement calculation. And I have created um, a group which has combined an ultimate limit state and service limit state combination. Now, if I do the calculation, if I would perform the calculation now, it will calculate the structure simply uh, with a constant subsoil. So the subsoil would just have a constant um, resistance. But of course you can also go more advanced and you can pick ground interaction as the model for a SIA. Now first let me explain a little bit about the difference between the two. So the ground, it is in fact modeled as a group of springs. But how you calculate them, that can be different. You have different approaches for this. The first approach is the Winkler model, which is a standard model. So the calculation that I have just done was with constant soil parameter, and that's according to the Winkler model. Now what you can also do is take into account ground interaction. That's according to the Pasternak model, which can be used in SIA by using the Solin model. The first model, the Winkler model, that's actually a heavy liquid model, but it's widely used. So it's the most simple model, but it's very widely used. And it assumes that the settlements of the subsoil will be uniform. So the plate will have a uniform settlement if there is a load that is also uniform. And the, the settlement parameter, it actually follows from the formula from Terzaghi. So if you have a certain load, then that immediately corresponds to a certain displacement. And that's also where this uh, soil parameter C1Z is used for. You will take the force, you will divide it by the... Um, soil constant and that will give you the settlement and then you have the horizontal um, soil parameters which are around 10% of the vertical one. The disadvantage of this is that you actually are not really taking into account interaction between parts of the ground. Um, so this is where the Pasternak model comes in the picture. This is an expansion of the previous model and there is a second constant which actually is kind of a derivative of the first one. So the second constant indicates how much your vertical force deviates in the horizontal direction. So this is a ve uh, much better approach of reality. But the only disadvantage is that it's quite difficult to calculate this C2 parameters. But the uh, solution for this is of course the Soylen model that has been implemented in C-Engineer. This Soylen model will use a certain iteration. So first it starts with default values for C1Z, C2X, C2Y. It will start with certain start values. You will give these in while you are modeling the structure. With these values it will do a certain linear calculation and find stresses in the ground. And then with these stresses it will calculate the deformation of the ground itself. So first of all your plate on a subsoil will have a certain deformation due to your um, initial subsoil parameters and then due to the uh, corresponding stresses you also have a certain settlement in the ground. These two should be the same so the deformation of your plate on the subsoil should be the same as the deformation of your subsoil. The plate and the subsoil would have to have the same deformation. The, the settlement from the subsoil is calculated by using the stresses uh, from the plate. So in fact you have to derive new uh, C1Z, C2X, C2Y parameters from this settlement calculation and redo the linear calculation with these new parameters. And then from this new calculation you will, you will have new contact stresses and due to the new contact stresses you can then again calculate the settlement in the subsoil and find new C1Z, C2X, C2Y parameters. Now, these iterations, they don't take long, they, uh, it's just three or four steps, usually. Now, what can be results? For example, if you have a uniform stress on a plate, uniform load on a plate, then you will see that in the Winkler model, you will have uniform stresses in the ground. But if you have the Pasternak model, you will see that there is higher stress in the middle and lower stress on the out outer edges. Same for the bending moments, you will see bending moments if you're using the Pasternak model, but not if you're using the Winkler model. And also your deformation, of course, if you have a plate with a constant load, 
then according to the Pasternak model, you will have more deformation in the center of the plate than on the edges of the plate. Now, how can you use this Pasternak model in C Engineer? So the Pasternak model is used with the Soilin module. And to activate this, you have to activate a functionality. You have to input a surface support. And in that surface support, you can say it has to be calculated according to the Soilin module. And the Soilin model will need a geologic profile. So because it's a more advanced calculation, it has also a need for a little bit more advanced information. You will have to input the profile of the ground, the geological profile which gives the e-modulus of the ground and the Poisson coefficient of the ground as well. And also the position of your borehole is very important because by placing it at certain heights you're indicating what the normal ground level would be. So if your structure would be below this normal ground le level that would indicate that you have done an excavation first and then place this element so that you are dealing with a pre-consolidated ground. And if you have multiple boreholes with different heights of the layers, then you can also indicate that your layers are not horizontal. And then to do perform the calculation, you will have to provide a linear combination of loads, so a certain set of loads for which you can do its iteration. And you will also have to indicate the mesh for the soil and starting values. Now let's apply this in C Engineer. Now this project has been calculated by using the Winkler model. Now let's apply the Pasternak model. To do this, we first have to activate the Soilin, which can be found in functionalities. Then we also have to activate um, Soilin for the subsoil itself. So this implies that if we would have more uh, subsoils, if you have indicated more surface on support, that you can choose whether or not you want all of them to be calculated according to Pasternak or Winkler or just some of them. Now let's choose Soilin for this one. And as I also indicated, the Soilin module also needs information about the subsoil itself, about the profile of the ground. That can be given by using a borehole profile. The borehole profile indicates which layers are in the ground. So for example, let's say that we have a first layer of 5 meters with an, an elasticity modulus of 20 then Poisson coefficient of something like this is given and 17 it's the dry weight and 20 is the wet weight the M value you don't have to change it is fixed in the formula normally but our Czech colleagues would like to modify them the thickness of the next layer is 8 meters and let's say that this ground is more rigid and use a dry weight of 18 for example. The water level would be at 8 meters. Then you can see that here in the image and it has a non-compressible subsoil below the latest layer. Now if you choose OK then I can go and place this borehole profile. You can see it here. Now the position that I'm placing it is Important if you have variable layers, which means if your layers have a variable thickness. In my case that's not really happening. But what we'll do is assume that uh, the ground had originally this height. It will see now that this subsoil is placed on this height. So it will assume that it has a pre-consolidated ground. The ground has already been compressed once. And before I can go to the solver setup, I have to de uh, define a combination for my Soilin. And the Soilin combination that I'm going to define has to be a linear type of combination. So in the solver setup, just before calculating, I have the parameters for the uh, Soilin calculation at the bottom. So here I can choose the Soilin, the maximum iteration steps, these are the default values. Now let's set these to 1, 1 and 0 0.15 for example. Sorry, this has to be 15. Leave the other ones at that. Okay. And my mesh, I will change my mesh to 0 0.5 meters. Well, 1 meter would also work because you need 1 to 2 times the thickness of the plate.
Now once the soiling calculation has finished, it will give a message about this. And now you can see the deformations itself. The results are available, so I'll go directly to the results. And in the results you can ask, for example, the 3D displacements for, let's say, our uh, combination. And then you will see here how the structure will deform under this combination. What I can also do is ask for the stresses. It's the same thing, combination, and then you see the stresses. Now, about the soiling calculation, I can also quickly show you that it has defined, locally, it has defined certain parameters, which I can still see. Okay, I can check. And has defined smaller parameters where there is bigger deformation, which is obviously where you have the most load in the ground. And the lower C parameters will result in higher deformation there, which is logic that you have the highest deformation where there is the most load in your ground. Now I'll continue to the internal forces of the plate. Now let's see, for example, uh, for the loads from the columns. For the loads from the columns, you will see that there is a high bending moment at the position where the columns arrive at the plate. Now, these high moments, this is because this column is modeled in a single point, it's connection in a single point. And in reality, it's divided over a certain surface. Now we can solve this by using averaging strips. And we will use a distance of 1 meter, so the columns are already 0 0.5 meters, so 1 is even small, not much. But because we have a subsoil, the Eurocode uh, does not allow us to, to take uh, the normal sizes here for an averaging strip. And I will place them at the bottom of the columns. So these averaging strips can now affect the results on the plate. So if we go back to internal forces and check the same result again, then this, this maximal moment of 142, if I would take on averaging of peak, it would be reduced. It would be reduced to 76. And you can also uh, nicely see that it has been divided or averaged over a certain region. Now let's go to the next step and do a reinforcement calculation. So in the concrete menu, so as you might have noticed, I'm just going from top to down. In the concrete menu, I have the 2D member reinforcement design. So under member design, I can immediately ask for my reinforcement. This member design will both use the ultimate limit state and service limit state. So the service limit state, that's the crack design to calculate the reinforcement in the plate. I will pick the ground plate on the subsoil. So I will set the selection to current. Here you can see that for this step I needed the class that I made earlier. I will not show the warnings, but I do want to show the errors. The errors are critical, the warnings are mostly informative. And I will activate averaging of peak, which indicates that I will take into account the averaging strips. So here you can see the amount of reinforcement that is required in the plate. Now you can see that you still have higher values here at the columns, which is quite normal. Um, but the values are displayed in just numbers. Now I can also transform these values into meshes, reinforcement meshes. I can do this with the scale isolines. So, for example, if my base would be a diameter 10 with a distance of 100, that would be equal to 785. If I would place additional reinforcement of 10, 200, that would be 1178. So, let's say that should be sufficient. And uh, if possible, I would like to use 10 distance 200 or 10 distance 300 if it's even possible. So I'm just adding these values. Then I choose OK again and I can check my result. And this palette is now transformed into these values. And it's quite simple. 
where it is green it means I need the diameter 10 distance 100 where it's it's darker green I need the diameter 10, 10 distance 100 and diameter 10 distance 200 and there are no regions uh, here there are some regions where I would not need anything now the AR1 that would be in one direction so by default that's the X direction of the plate and the 1 means lower side if I would do the same thing for the upper side 1 plus for example then you will see that actually you need the same thing and there are just little positions where you need no reinforcement probably because it's the minimal required amount of reinforcement if you want you can also tick that off but by default we take into account the codes of the euro code uh, which explain what the minimal amount of reinforcement is that you need let's just jump forward and do a punching check so we have a punching check and uh, to do a punching check you need reinforcement in the plate but we already have this because we just calculated theoretical reinforcement so we can use this theoretical reinforcement to check our um, punching and let's do it in each node now the result is smaller than one if no punching reinforcement is necessary then you will actually see how much you are using from the resistance without punching reinforcement if it is equal to one then it means that you need punching reinforcement to have a sufficient resistance and if it's bigger than one then it means that your concrete cannot take that punching force now in the preview I can see what the results are from the punching checks the first table will explain to me what the resistance is at the zero uh, the first perimeter so the first perimeter that's at the edge of the column so with the maximal amount of punching reinforcement I would be able to take 4.82 shear force per meter if I go further it will explain to me in the second table what reinforcement in the plate is in each node then it will give me the load in each section so the most critical load from this combination and finally it will calculate punching reinforcement the shear force is 0 0.17 this results in the check of 0 0.2 because your force is only 20% of your resistance now you can also do a more detailed check I also have a single check for my punching then I can check more in detail what he did so first of all my combination has four possible loads load situations it took this reinforcement into account and then design of reinforcement will calculate shear reinforcement now first of all I can pick here a certain combination it will result in certain loads and then for that combination I can see here results in each section so in each certain distance from the start in this section I can check it I can uh, check this section from the X or the Y direction and in the first section for example I will see that I do not need shear reinforcement. Why? Because this is the applied force and this is the concrete resistance. Now finally I uh, will talk a little bit about the engineering report, so your uh, paper document which explains your project. And for this engineering report, well I can send a lot of things from SIA to this engineering report, like for example uh, this picture for this view I can send the live picture to the engineer report then this image will arrive in the engineer report so I will insert it and close this image now I can do the same thing for example for my uh, just my normal structure uh, let's view and let's send it live picture to the engineer report so it's called live picture because the picture in the engineer report will still be linked to this model and if I change this model then the picture will change too let's do the same one but then with loads so for example these are our ground loads and I will send the picture to the engineer report now let's go to the engineer report itself 
you can see that the engineer report exists here and if I go to engineer report well it's empty and to fill it you simply have to fill things in the navigator so for example if you want the header then you fill it in here if you want the image that I have sent then you can find them here in the inbox or they can also be directly created if you already have a report so if you click on my image then here you'll see the image of my model or uh, this one would be the image of my loads and if you want to build an entire model you just have to complete a list here and you can even link things to dynamically create your report so for example if I would pick my set of load cases then I can link this image on my load case so that I would see this image for each load case that is selected here in this, this, this item so for load case 1 these are the loads placed in load case self fate for load case 2 you would see these loads 0 to 16 and so on or I can also do this with tables and then you have load for example if I would pick point force just exactly the same uh, if I would have line force if I would have free surface loads it all works exactly the same for example for load case 1 I don't have any point line force or free surface loads so I just see the image load case 2 I see the image and then I see the free surface loads but I do not see any line force or, or point force so it already takes that into account and then you can also go on and you can use templates and finally you can export it to PDF and I will export for example this image as a 3D PDF and use my export option to export it to PDF now this report will open afterwards and then here you will have your entire report as I had it just a minute ago in C Engineer. I also ticked that thing on with the 3D PDF. So if my PDF allows it, then I can also manipulate the image still in the PDF. So um, that would in fact immediately throw away the fact when, when people tell you that your model is not clear enough, um, that they cannot see a detail well enough because with the 3D image, well, that can be an issue anymore. You can see really everything. So to sum up our webinar, as I have shown you, you can easily model in C Engineer. You can also use the WG, DXF or, or other grids as basis for your model. Um, and you can model with free loads, you can model a lot of things. But we use it for soil and water loads. And then you can calculate either with Winkler uh, by just doing the linear calculation or with uh, Pasternak, to, so the Solin module. And the Sodin model had an iterative calculation to calculate really the response of the ground on the structure and also another way around. Then we went to the results and I showed you quickly the results, the averaging strips, and uh, we quickly did a reinforcement design to the reinforcement design and also showed you this extensive punching check. And the engineer report, you, as you can see, uh, it was very fast, easy, and dynamic. Um, and its simplicity and its strain together makes it very useful to quickly create your documents. Now, I would suggest that you try these steps yourself. You can either try this in your own version of C Engineer or you can ask for a demo version. If you would have more questions, feel free to contact us. And we also have more webinars in store for you. Uh, for example, here at the CIA.net website under the webinars, or you can go to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your attention.